Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome to another edition of Real Conversations, where I'm excited to have my friend, Dr. Richard Peterson, who's the CEO of the Market Site Companies. He's also the author of Inside the Investor's Brain, one of my favorite books, gotta buy it, uh, and the follow-on book, which can't yet be one of my favorite books because I haven't finished reading it, which is called Trading on Sediment. Uh, but doctor, thank you for making the time. Thanks, Keith. Yeah. You're very busy, man. You got, so for people that don't know, you're advising people on, on not only how to run their money now officially because you have your fund, uh, but you're mm -hmm. also like a psychologist with money managers. Uh, I feel like you're instructing me too with your daily written, oh. you know, or at least your notes. Uh, right. You got so much going on. It's, it must be exciting. Well, it, it is exciting, and you know, fundamentally, when you look at our field, which is behavioral economics, there's there's three ways that you can focus on market psychology and how to how to optimize market psychology. One is in the individual, so how do you help traders or portfolio managers yeah. do a better job? Uh, the second one is in markets, so how do you uh, provide tools to markets, like we do with our data business, uh, sentiment data business, or how do you take advantage of patterns in markets that are based on investor sentiment? Uh, and then the third is how do you better serve your clients? So if you're a financial advisor, how do you help your clients? So we've fundamentally set up Market Psych to be a uh, behavioral economics consultancy uh, to try to help people use the science of behavioral economics in their daily life in the financial industry. Mm -hmm. And you're really the pioneer, from my perspective, I think you're the pioneer because you're, you're not only uh, coming from the scientific side, but you're also a market practitioner. I mean, you've yeah, ran true. your own fund before. You work with hedge fund managers. You work with registered investment advisors. And, and you've kind of found your way through this. And a lot, of, a lot of academics don't. They really just don't actually apply what it is that they're doing. It's a good point. I, I actually started as a quantitative trader in the mid-90s. Uh, so I did an electrical engineering undergraduate degree, and I used to program neural network software to find patterns. Well, that's what we all do. Oh, program oh yeah. yeah, that's how we all got into Wall Street, right? But, yeah, so we have that similar background. Yeah, right. so go, on, go ahead. <laughs> so um, so we'd, we'd find patterns, or these systems would find patterns in prices, and uh, I created a trading model that I thought looked pretty good on the yeah. S&P. And so I started trading it after college. And some days it would tell me to go long, you know, but the news would be very negative, and I would think, well, Maybe I'll just wait a day. Maybe I don't need to go long today. Or, or other days it would tell me to go short, and I'd think, you know, things are looking pretty good. I kind of like it. I'm going to keep riding this. Mm -hmm. And it was those days when I overruled the system that it had its best signals. And it, with, with the system itself, it was making money. With me running the system, it was not making money. Mm. Uh, so I became very interested then is probably these, there are some psychological patterns, not only in me, but in the whole market that this system is finding. Yeah. So if I can tap into that, I could, you know, potentially tap into the real science behind it. And I, I did, a, you know, I looked at the books that were available at the time. Um, psychology used to be very anecdotal, you know, a lot of oral fixations and things like that. And it, it wasn't really applicable. Uh, and so I started looking into the newer neuroscience research, and they were starting to do a lot of work on risk taking and how people think about money and how they think about their investments and how they go wrong, uh, again and again and again. So now we're able to find how information uh, affects people systematically and causes them to overreact with their money or underreact, and it creates patterns in the prices that we can then exploit as quants. Because mm -hmm, it's emotion. I mean, we go, exactly. I can't count how many times, I really can't count how many times because on Hedge Eye TV now we have this live macro show. So we have a live oh, Q&A, mm -hmm. a lot of individuals, but a lot of institutional subscribers as well. And I'm telling you, Richard, mm -hmm. I can't say it's 100% because that would be qualitative, but it's a very high percentage of questions have to do with the emotion of the moment, in particular when it comes to macro market moves. Right. And you talk a lot about that. I mean, that's really kind of the cornerstone of what you believe is that we shouldn't really act on our emotions. Uh, it, that's a great point. Actually, you should act on your emotions to an extent, but you should also be very resilient and willing to change your mind very quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. So it turns out, so we've run personality tests online. We have these free personality tests for investors. <laughs> on traders. your website? On our website. It's actually, uh, it's hard to find now. You have to Google it because we've, kind of deprioritize them, but about 30,000 people have taken them since 2004. Really? It's at, it's at test.marketpsych.com okay. is, is where it is, but uh, you won't find it on our website. <laughs> you have to Google it. Um, but those tests, uh, people who've taken those tests, when we looked at the results, it turns out that um, openness is a very high indicator of performance, the personality trait of openness mm. and emotional stability, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, as you would imagine. You have to be able to you know, calm down after things have been turbulent. Um, but so personality traits do matter, but they're not that strong. What's actually stronger than those personality traits is 
a, a cognitive trait or a thinking trait, which is how fast can you calculate expected values mm. in a given situation? So if I offer you odds uh, of a given gamble, if I say, you know, this stock, you know, it's likely to do this kind of performance and this one's likely to do that, yep. can you very quickly figure out, is that better than a bond or should I pick one of those stocks? You know, can you mentally do that quickly? That uh, predicts your performance in investing. You're right. Your, your ability to weigh probabilities in real time. Right. In real time. We call it intuitive expected value calculation. And we have a test on our website called the Market Psych Gambling Task yeah. that was actually designed uh, by a neuro originally by a neurologist to test patients that he had that would have brain tumors removed and they would make a lot of mistakes with their money. Wow. And they couldn't, there was no psychological test to capture. Why are these people maxing out their credit cards and making these silly mistakes with their money when everything else is fine with them? Their IQ is fine. Everything's fine. Hmm. And so he, he created, it was Antonio Damasio created this type of test. We've uh, refined it and made it more applicable to financial markets, and then we applied it. And sure hmm. enough, it shows very high correlation with returns. That's neat. I mean, most yeah. things that you find, if they don't have a correlation, you don't use it. Uh, yeah, true, I mean, true. But it's, um, it's interesting. I want to get it a little, get through it a little bit more in terms of, of people getting a baseline of who you are and what you've done. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. The text-based analysis, just like, can you explain what you've done there in terms of your sure. actual data that you've aggregated? Because you really have... I think you have a, the, the world's only data set, and certainly that's unique to you, but the way that you, you thought about it in the beginning and what it looks like. Yeah, great. I'm glad you brought that up. So w after I did the quantitative trading, I realized that I needed to understand the sentiments in the markets, but there was no systematic way to do that. There was yeah. no uh, scientific way to do that. So um, I went to medical school from there to try to understand the biology of decision making, and then during my uh, psychiatry residency, uh, I started hearing more and more about sentiment analysis and text analytics, yep. which, which is a science where it, what we do now with our software is we go through every business and finance related article, tweet, uh, commentary, blog, et cetera, mm -hmm. including your content. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and we, uh, it's a good thing my 100,000 something tweets actually are applied to somebody's. Uh, yeah, somebody. there are servers <laughs> processing them and thinking deeply about them right now. <laughs> so you take all that stuff. It's social media, really, has, has been your friend in this regard, because that's so, where you social get Social media. Stuff. And that's where we got the idea uh, originally, but also news, because we're partnered with Thomson Reuters, so we get their low latency news feed and a lot of their news partners feeds. Exactly. So we ended up uh, with 2,000 global news sources and uh, 800 different social media sites. And we actually create two pipes of data. Uh, and the way we do it is we analyze every meaningful phrase about a tradable asset in the world. Mm. Uh, we then look at how people are referring to it. And we found uh, through a review of the psychology literature that some factors like uncertainty, uh, if somebody says, you know, Janet Yellen is still uncertain about what's going to happen with interest rates, um, that mark of uncertainty about the fixed income market tells us that um, actually things are likely to be better than people expect mm -hmm. because people tend to be risk averse to uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So um, we've done research now using indexes like uncertainty or fear or uh, urgency, these types of psychological factors. We've broken them down, quantified them, uh, and we now sell them as time series through Thomson Reuters. They're called the Thomson Reuters Market Psych Indices. Hmm. Uh, and we've done a lot of testing on that data, too. So it's like topics, emotions, beliefs, you know, things that, that, that move. Exactly. So even uh, with an individual company, we're measuring uh, uh, fundamental strength, how people are talking about the balance sheet of the company, mm. or even earnings forecast, uh, all the future tense references to earnings rising or falling. When you get a few million articles or tweets, you can actually create an interesting composite of where's the market's expectations for earnings, uh, for products, for the whole company. So you've really, I mean, you, you've taken a qualitative group of words or word pairs and you've quantified it effectively exactly. in, a, in a time series. Exactly. And if you don't go all the way back and you don't do it, you know, rinse and repeat it, you're just not going to have that time series. Oh, that's right. So, and we've got it back to 1998. Now. 1998 now? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So all the original social media. So you've taken that and you obviously now have a fund. Is it an RIA? Or is it's it? an RIA. Okay. That's right. Yeah. And you, so you're going to have your own strategies on that. But, but mm -hmm. how does like, you know, the individual or even an RIA themselves, like mm -hmm. how, it's somebody else, because you advise RIAs on a lot of different things. Yeah, but true. Yeah, how, how, how would somebody use what, what it is that you have if they're like just sitting there looking at your website? Is that even possible? It, it is possible, but it's difficult. Right. So that's why I wrote uh, that book, Trading on Sentiment, was I have done hundreds of seminars uh, talking about the science of applying market psychology and using market psychology. And uh, on the individual level, when I do coaching with clients, that was really based on the book Inside the Investor's Brain that you talked about. Yep. But we realized that on the macro level, on the market level, all of the traders can optimize themselves, but they have to also understand how 
cycles of emotion and psychology go through the markets. Mm. So certain topics or memes are hot, and then they're not. And the question is, how does that change price action? Mm -hmm. So we started then applying a, the science of behind this data, uh, studying and back testing this data and figuring out what are the predictive models for this data uh, so that we can predict asset prices. Hmm. So trading on sentiment is about that, about predicting so asset So this prices. should give people a very good baseline on how to use uh, behavioral in terms of how you've defined it, or at least your inputs, right. to help them, as opposed to just using traditional technical or sediment indicators of which you know the market is littered with what I'd affectionately call old wall sediment indicators that are just really, they don't really back test, so I don't use them personally. Yeah, well, you know, to be honest with you, a lot of the stuff that we produce, it also doesn't back test very well. So we produce a number of different types of yep. sediment. Uh, there are some that are quite reliable, like trust. Um, if you use really? the trust index in equities, that predicts the S&P, uh, even simple moving average crossovers of trust on a monthly basis mm -hmm. are quite predictive of where the S&P is going the next month. So um, in your book, do you actually yeah. you know, highlight that, that you have your trust factor? We uh, do. Okay, so yeah. you go through you go through the series of factors that you look at and what back tests well. well that's right. That's okay. right. So trust, anger, uncertainty. Um, anger. <laughs> yeah, anger, which is somewhat correlated with trust, but not entirely. Yeah, how about uh, how about loss aversion? Uh, so we can't really measure loss. So interestingly, so loss aversion is a function of risk perception. Mm -hmm. So if you are don't want to lose, it's usually because you're scared uh -huh. of something. So we measure that with fear, and we find that fear. So fear is a funny thing because. Uh, when Ebola hits the market. <laughs> now, fear associated with a biotech stock is good yes. because it means, okay, they're going to make the vaccine and I'm terrified of this Ebola. You better hurry, right? And the share prices go up. But fear with American Airlines is bad yes. because it means I'm not flying in American Airlines. I'm scared I'm going to get Ebola from yep. my, you know, my seatmate. Or fear for, like, I mean, the most recent example is the fear of an interest rate hike. And we've had six, what I quantify as six you know, discernible rate hike freakouts. Yeah, mean, really, false alarms, in 16 yeah. months. Right. Where you could have bought bonds instead of freaking out that there would be a rate hike. Yeah, um, that's good would is that a tangible fear that you've you've looked at recently? We haven't looked sp systematically at rate hike fear, although I know mm -hmm. a lot of people do. And actually, uh, an academic group did look at our data around rate hikes, and they did find that the more fear the in the our fear index that there would be more volatility following the rate hikes and typically more of a rebound like you. Yeah, the rebounds we've seen a lot. I mean, it's interesting. Bre you've done Brexit. I've read your Yeah, your we actually successfully uh, rode the market through Brexit. What was fascinating about that is not only- Because you, you had your fund. Yeah, we actively <laughs> traded through that. Nice. Yeah, yeah it was great That's why fun. you're so yeah. happy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> because a set, somebody who's you, fading the fear or fading whatever it is that you're-, you're Oh, it was, you're, it was wonderful. Really? Yeah. You, well, it was wonderful. Well, it, you know, You're the only guy. Oh, there's a it, very small percentage of fund managers that Oh, it was wonderful. Brexit was wonderful. Well, it, I mean, we don't know what the long-term implications will be for the UK, so I don't want to minimize. You know, it's not wonderful, but no. uh, we don't know. It's change, right? So we'll see how things evolve. But what was interesting with Brexit was everybody. Well, why I say it was wonderful was because everyone was lined up, including myself, thinking, "Oh, they're going to remain." And that morning, our machine learning model came out and said, "No, no, no. Time to short. You better get short." And I thought, you know, no way. <laughs> the, right. And again, but then I thought, wait, every time I override my model, I'm wrong. You know, t historically, that's the wrong time. <laughs> and it's because we're all, we cannot escape, um, and I, the group think, whether we believe it or not, you know, and I'm, yeah. I'm just as vulnerable as everybody else, even knowing it. We're all vulnerable to group thinking. There's only, there are a few select traders who are not. Um, some of them are psychopaths, mm -hmm. right? And, and they're able to dissociate themselves from that empathic feeling. But they can't feel anything at all. Yeah, but for the rest of us, when we feel that, we, we just have to become better and better at identifying that to become better traders. Mm. To say, okay, you know what, wait a minute, we're all thinking it's going to remain, I need to, I need to be careful here. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, because I, mean, I, I, I often try <laughs> to explain why I use my risk range process. And I often ah. say it's just so that I fade myself. Interesting. Like, cause, yeah. you know, risk range, meaning that if you're at the top of the range, you sell or you're short. Right. At the low end of the range, you buy and you cover. Mm -hmm. And it's always the worst, I shouldn't say always, but typically it's the worst feeling. You know, to be doing precisely what my model tells me to do. Mm -hmm. And I often, I mean, if I don't override myself, I, I agree with you 100%. That's where I make my biggest mistakes, is where I say, well, the low end of the range looks like I shouldn't be doing anything here. I shouldn't cover any yeah. shorts. Then I'll look at it a month later, Richard, and then like, oh my God. I, I mean, that was the most obvious spot to cover shorts of the year. Uh, it's, it's painful. Yeah, yeah, it's painful. And it, every time we will fall into that trap, and it's it's just human nature. But that's mm -hmm. the that's why we... That's really why I started studying this science and then why we designed yeah. the data and then why we're creating trading models based on it. And why we have to use machine learning 
because machines don't, they can, number one, they can think of all those different factors right. and figure out all the times in the last 17 years of our data that those factors aligned in that mm -hmm. way and what happened next. Mm -hmm. And so they can very precisely understand movements in the media and how the movements in the media affect the bulk of traders and then prices. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because when we first start, we've known each other for a little while now, and when we yeah. first started talking, I knew that you were almost too early because yeah, you're, you're, right. you're too smart, obviously, and too early, and mm. people just couldn't apply it. Today, you're like perfect because everybody wants a rules-based investor, mm. which you're basically saying, uh, if I don't follow the rules, I'm in, I'm in hot water. Yeah. Uh, and you have, you know, you have a machine learning system that you created yourself. So yeah. has, has the tone changed in terms of the questions or people's level or ability to understand what it is that you do? It's a great question. Um, a little bit. There's more, you know, people are, they hear machine learning now and they know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's a code word. It's a code word now. They say, oh, AlphaGo. You know, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Rules-based. Yeah, yeah it, it, it does succeed at times. You yeah. know? And um, rules-based, right. Now, the, the, the... I heard one guy, I mean, he was just a major uh, hedge hmm. fund platform. He went to another one, or was trying to, he's interviewing right now. Oh, yeah. And he was frustrated. We're on the golf course and he said to me, he said, because I can't prove that I'm rules-based, I can't get my job back. Interesting. Because he wow. has too much, he thinks too much. You know, he thinks he's too much. He's Interesting. he's a stock picker, uh, right. and he's not. But you're you're are you 100% rules based? It's 100% rules based. Oh my, this is going to go over so well. It's 100% <laughs> quant. Yeah, yeah. Um, you but, have no ability to to do anything other than follow the rules. Right. Huh. You know, without testing it, without empirically. So when, what's amazing with this particular machine learning model uh, is when you apply it to crude oil, for example, uh, it works even better. Than the S&P. Really? Uh, when you apply it to large cap stocks, it works very well. Uh, so the same type of learning model applied to media data uh, works across assets. Well, that oil's a great topic because we've, I uh, mean, internally we have to, so I'm still stuck in this spot where I don't have your machine learning, um, okay. but I have to deal with the noise. So oil, mm -hmm. great topic because it's either freeze or no freeze. And mm -hmm. then I get our energy right. policy analyst in Washington Joe McMonagall's like, well, I don't, th I don't think that it's there's going to be a freeze. Right. So the market's always constantly back and forth, but it's so mean reverting. Mm -hmm. And if you look at oil in the last three to six months, it's really just done a lot of chop, right. chopped everybody up. Oil volatility's, I think today is at 40 or 42. Oh yeah. You know, so what do what do you see when you see oil? Do you think that it's wonderful, or can you do you do well with it? Well, it, the the model does. So that's a great question. So. Monitoring sentiment in oil is very difficult because you have the consumers and the producers. Yes. And one's happy when the other's sad, and vice versa, <laughs> right? So when we, we monitor text, you know, we have to know is it the South Dakota Times, you know, and they're depressed, or or, or the Dallas Morning News is sad about oil prices going down, but then the Sacramento Bee is happy, you know. So <laughs> yeah, you have to figure out where it's coming from, and that's challenging. So we find with currencies and commodities that a better metric of sentiment is where people say the price is going. Oh, really? People talk in their book, basically. Oh, okay. So the more that they talk in one direction, uh, if you create, say, two moving averages, and you cross them over on crude oil, since we found this back in 2014, right before the crash started, and it has been almost 100% accurate in catching every major monthly move. Really? Just the crisscrossing of where people say it's going is where it tends to go. So the, but the chatter in the media seems to be I mean, maybe not driving it, but certainly people are talking their book and then they're acting on it. Yeah, well, when you think about standard deviations of risk or any like any kind of measurable risk range of a mm -hmm. price that's really just trading in a range, right? I mean, it's only natural to believe that when on the way down, you're going to hear everyone say, I nailed it and I think it's going to go even yeah, lower. And true. when it's up, the, you know, they're going to do the, the opposite. So isn't that just yeah. it? People just talking their book after the move? Well, no, this is before the move. That's before the move, That's saying. what's interesting. Yeah, this is... Oh, I thought you meant after the no, move. No, no, this they is talk the their book. this is the chatter that precedes the move. So people are saying, wow. "I think it's going down," or "It's going down," and the more they talk like that, the more it goes down. That's and then they reverse and they start to say, "Well, actually, it might be going up now," and it actually goes up. Wow. So somebody is, you know, the bulk of people is actually accurately talking up crude oil and down crude oil. How about gold? So it's interesting. You see anything squirrely going on there? You know, gold is a lot trickier to forecast. Oh yeah. Um, and I don't know why. I don't know if it is because you know central banks are buying or whatever it is, but we don't have a good beat on gold. Nothing as reliable as crude oil. What? what uh, so um, oil's the number one thing that you've have a beat on? It's been the most accurate and the least volatile in terms mm. of the information flow from the media predicting it. Right. It's it's pretty spot on. What's the most uh, uh, inaccurate and most volatile? Well, there's these very, uh, you know, we look at, uh, actually cattle is pretty good, but I think there's cattle. some like um, hogs that aren't so good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're good at cotton, coffee, you know, there's, it's interesting. There's, 
some of the commodities it's not good at and some of it is good at. It That's just depends. It's the ones that are really information driven versus the ones that are more clubby and internal. We can't detect that because there's no, the media doesn't influence them. Right. Well, it, isn't yeah. it, did you ever think that when you first, I mean, you first started doing this yeah. and you're, you know, you're, you're banging away at the keys and now like however many years <laughs> later, I'm pretty good at cotton. Yeah, I'm pretty good at cotton. Feeling pretty good about, did you think you'd be good at cotton? Uh, no idea. Yeah, no idea. <laughs> yeah. You're not. No, I mean, the reason we figured it out is somebody said, hey, check out that cotton bubble. How did it do with the cotton bubble? And we looked back and we were ah. like, oh my God, this was like so interesting. This is the sentiment perfectly predicted, the ups and downs of cotton. Do you do better one post, post busts and bubbles? Uh, great question. Yes. Uh, they, it, the data tends to time tops very well. So the Chinese bubble, uh, the tech bubble, um, Every a major bubble. It's a lot of bubbles. <laughs> and when things, so the, the, cool, the very interesting thing psychologically about a bubble is, as you know, everyone holds on until the end, right? Until the music stops. Mm -hmm. um, but the music kind of gets quiet before it stops. Yeah. And the media will start to get negative. And you can see the tops of these bubbles yeah. in the media. Negativity starts and then the price mm, tumbles. That's interesting. So there's generally, it's a very good timing tool. In fact, one of our biggest clients uh, use, was in the media saying that they use our sentiment data to, to they got it got out before the January correction this year, mm -hmm. and they got out before the uh, August correction last year mm -hmm. because they saw the sentiment go equities, through. U.S. equities, U.S. equities. Yeah, that was a good they were, spot they're a long only fund. So. Yeah, if you sold in yeah. December or coming into January and or coming out of July of last year, uh, it's a great great spot yeah. to sell. So yeah. they were so happy. Fortunately, they talked about it in the media, so it adds more credibility. Yeah, I mean, for I mean, the, I think I mean uh, the older we get, and maybe this will all happen when we're gone because the machine learning will be so much more pervasive. But yeah. like I've always called tops processes, not points, and I try to measure them in terms of the lower highs, the relationship between price, volume, and volatility. Mm. So if I start to see lower highs, and I start to mm -hmm. see more volume on down days and up days, and I see rising volatility. That three-factor composite model is usually the way that I try to waddle my way, way into a short that's just hit its timing. Nip, just know, right. It's bubble. I mean, if I were ever to dare do that, mm -hmm. which I dare a lot, um, yeah. if I had your stuff on top of it, it's just one more big factor. It's a behavioral factor, effectively. Is that not right? Yeah, exactly. You would yeah. never like. I mean, well, actually, you're saying that you would use one. Just just your factor would be enough, or somebody might. We your one of your clients thought that. Yeah, I mean, uh, we haven't tested it with other factors, but just our own factor seems to be very good at right. just pure media sentiment. Yeah. How does the media feel about this? You know, usually they're good. Oh, yeah, buy into tech stocks. They're great. They're great. Yeah. Uh, maybe not so great. And as that starts to turn south, that's a pretty clear indicator the bubble's over. If you could have everyone's factors, because I'm perfectly happy oh, to I go see. with my price volume volatility right. model. Yeah, You're exactly. perfectly happy to go with your factor-based model. If you could have everyone's factor-based model, would you take it, or would you just stay with what you're, you're developing on your own? So I would stay, I think everyone I mean everyone, like Renaissance's yeah. best stuff. I mean, if we all had the, if you could see everyone's best stuff. Oh yeah, I would love to see Renaissance's right. best stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, without a doubt, that's the place to go. But I would, you know, in general, we should all stick with what we're good at, what our expertise is. Right. Uh, and so I, I would say you should stick with what you know, uh, just like I should stick with what I know. It's okay to add in new processes. Yep. Like if I showed you the sentiment indicator, you could say, yeah, that makes sense. But I, the traders who blow up that I've seen are the ones who try something new, but they don't understand the statistics behind it. And Bingo. They don't have the confidence because I they haven't had the experience the with it. Exactly. Every time that somebody's having an issue, I feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm an unqualified psychologist, but by the way, I am a <laughs> full-time psychologist right. because clients are constantly asking me what the hell's going on. Right. And I always go back to what is your process? Right. And every single time, like you said, you, I can, I can, the caricature of somebody who's been blowing up in this market, and we have unfortunately seen clients blow up mm. or different PMs lose right. their job. I mean, it's that they actually don't have a process. Right. Or they're not quite sure what that process can be, mm -hmm. and they flip. And they, the boundaries aren't clear enough. Yes, yeah. it's always the same. Exactly. Uh, but it, um, it's an interesting thing. So I, I often wonder how long it's going to take me to evolve my process to the place where I just think it's bulletproof, which is probably never. How long do you think, uh, how much work do you have to do, in other words? To, to, get, uh, to your process, get your process bulletproof? To get your process um, to a place where, you know, Madoff's bulletproof, because it's made up. I mean, <laughs> how much work, like I, I, I have a lot of work to do before, yeah. before, you know, God willing, I go away from this world. Yeah. But how much work do you think you have to do to keep your, building your process to where you want it to be? Well, it's a great question. Uh, I don't think you ever stop, right? right? I think you're always evolution, evol evolving. Mm -hmm. Um, as you get new information, but you've, so you, number one, you've got to be open to the evolution, but number two, you can't be, you know, skitter-scatter, jumping in and out. You can't be <laughs> impulsive about it, yeah. right? 
So it's got to be thought out. You've got to know what your discipline is and your expertise. Uh, but then if you have something new, you migrate into it. Like I was at a shop in Chicago just now. Everybody at the shop was mandated to take the Andrew Ng uh, machine learning class at Stanford on Coursera. Really? Everybody has Every taken- Every trader or analyst um, or PM? They're all of them. Well, all the PMs and all the analysts. Really? Yeah. yeah. So That's not the, not the execution stuff there. traders, but yeah. 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 Wow. And then they also took the statistical, like, statistics for finance class too. So, the, so they're evolving. But you know, I asked them, how are, you, how are you using this? And they said, well, not yet. Hmm. You know, and some of them don't believe in it. They're trying to get smart on it. But they're working on it, right? They're evolving slowly. That, that's a big, yeah. I mean, it's a phase transition um, exactly. that I see in PMs is that they've, they finally, especially the qualitative stock pickers, yeah. they finally started to say, OK, I don't give up on what I do, mm -hmm. but I'm open arms, ready and willing for you to teach me what, what you do, Keith. Right. And that, it, the, some of the best meetings ever because you have these super intellectual people that are very accomplished and have been successful, but they've been going through a very tough time in the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if that's the same experience that you have. We have seen, uh, I have seen that unfortunately quite a lot. That's right. Yep. I mean, Wall Street is definitely changing and it's changing very rapidly these days. That's why it's like a, um, a real phase transition. In other words, yeah. like I'm never going to use quantum mental behavioral, any of your risk ranges, Keith, I got, I, I know what I'm doing here. Right. I mean, we, so on the sentiment side of thing, what I, when I encounter a manager like that, I often show them some of our other models that are kind of interesting. One is uh, if you're a pure value investor. So a lot of stock pickers, right. they look at value, right? Yep. Um, I show them, look, if you add, so a traditional value model, extreme value model since uh, 1999, trading just the top 5% uh, of value stocks in the S&P 500, uh, just by P.E. ratio, so the lowest 5% mm -hmm. by P.E., uh, performed about six-fold return since 1999. Mm -hmm. Every year, just rotating yep. into the lowest P.E. stocks. Uh, if you intersect that with the fear factor, so you take only those stocks that are both value stocks and are associated with fear, so there's overreaction to something. Mm -hmm. People freaked out about something. Mm -hmm. uh, then you get a 24-fold return wow. since 1999, right? So three-fold, more than, you know, four-fold. Because now yeah. you're buying them when they're super cheap, increase. not cheap, just super cheap. Well, you're, people freak you're buying out. them because they're cheap because people freaked out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not because they're cheap because there's a good solid fundamental reason. No, because people are like, oh my God, Eastman Kodak's never going to, actually, I'm probably using one that they should have freaked out about. Right. But, you, but you know the point. But like, there were cycles yeah, too. Okay. Eastman. Yeah. So you're um, showing them where value really performs is because it has a freak out factor. Exactly. The, the overreaction. Yep. So the, 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 what a lot of people are using, a lot of those qualitative guys are doing, is they are judging sentiment, but they're doing it qualitatively. And yep. as long as you can explain that, look, you're looking for overreaction to some bad news, typically, mm -hmm. and then you're looking to underreaction as the stock starts to recover. So there's a catalyst. You see the catalyst, but other people don't see it. Mm -hmm. And you know that it's solid. You just need to be confident that that thing is sound, mm -hmm. you know, for example. And eventually, people will recognize that, and it'll recover. Some of the best factors we found was not just fear, but anger. So when com people are angry at a company, it tends to recover quite nicely. Uh, when people don't trust the management team, that's mm -hmm. a really good one. Mm -hmm. uh, so management scandals, any kind of anger because of products or whatever it is, probably mm -hmm. Samsung would be a good, good example these days. <laughs> the exploding phone. Oh, and I've got one here. It's not ticking, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many things to yeah. talk about. But I, I, yeah. I think that we've at least given people a pretty good feel for you know what it is that you do, and yeah. I, I think you're. I think there's so many more uh, chapters to Richard Peterson's career on this front. I hope so. There's a lot to. We're really excited. We're finally making some real headway with the science now. So and, yeah. and the applications. Science yeah. is good. People like science. They well, like the process. applications are the key. Yeah. You got to have a business out of it. You just so. got to make sure you don't hide it from all of us. That's the only. Oh, hide it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or don't or, charge too much. Or obscure it. <laughs> obscure it. Yeah, with jargon. Yeah. He's he's Richard Peterson. I'm Keith McCullough. You can find Richard's website right here.